The Diana class were a series of three protected cruisers built for the Imperial Russian Navy at the turn of the 20th century. It's often forgotten that in the late 19th century, the German and US navies barely registered on the scale of the Great Powers. The two forces the Royal Navy were worried about were France and Imperial Russia. In the latter case, the last two decades of that period saw the Russians focusing on two goals. A force of large armoured cruisers for commerce raiding, and two battle fleets, one in the Baltic, the other in the Black Sea. By the 1890s, the number of battleships under construction were increasing, and the sheer cost of massive armoured cruisers like the Rurik was proving to be somewhat off-putting. At this point, they also had to worry about the Germans, whose naval forces were suddenly expanding at an almost exponential rate. And thus, after a lot of arguments, designs and redesigns, a cruiser type began to emerge. It needed to function as a fleet scout and screen in the enclosed seas, but would also need the speed and sea keeping to be able to operate on the open ocean. But it would also have to be affordable in numbers, which in turn meant that it would need to be relatively small, and that meant a protected cruiser instead of an armoured one. After a number of fairly fast revisions to improve stability and hull strength, the final design that came in at just over 6,600 tonnes was ordered, with two ships, Diana and Palada, laid down in 1895, and Aurora laid down in 1896. As with many cruisers of the period, they were initially conceived with a couple of single heavy guns fore and aft, along with a 6-inch broadside battery, but advances in quick-firing technology meant that the 8-inch guns under consideration were replaced by additional 6-inch guns during the design process. Thus, the ships carried a main battery of 8 single 6-inch guns, one fore, one aft, and three on each broadside, with the overall layout being something of a slight diamond pattern that allowed the fore and aft broadside pairs to fire directly ahead or astern, respectively, giving a 5-gun broadside, but also a 3-gun ahead or astern salvo. In recognition of the rising threat of torpedo boats, no less than two dozen 3-inch guns mounted almost like an old ship of the line in two gun decks, each with 6 guns per side, with the upper gun decks sharing deck space with the 6-inch weapons. Higher up were eight 37mm guns, with a rather interesting feature. Their gun stops could be removed, so that in the event of a boarding action, they could be fired directly down onto the ship's deck. A couple of guns were packed away for use on land, and a trio of torpedo tubes, two submerged, one on each broadside, and one aft above the water completed the ship's armament. Armour protection consisted of a protected deck with a maximum 2.5 inch thickness on the slopes, trending down as it went flat. With just over 11,500 indicated horsepower provided by vertical triple expansion engines that drove three shafts, they were supposed to be capable of 20 knots, although only around 19 knots was ever achieved in actual practice, largely due to additional weight imposed by the addition of more and larger guns to the design at the last minute following the launch of new foreign warships. This relatively uncommon triple shaft arrangement was designed to allow for cruising on a single central propeller, with the wing units enabled for high-speed action. By the time of their completion and commissioning, it was now the 20th century, and Russia's priorities had shifted. Diana and Pallada were dispatched to the Pacific, where they were not particularly warmly received, as their handling, speed, quality of finish, amount of firepower, as well as certain other design choices were all compared unfavourably to foreign-built cruisers in the force such as the Ascolt and Variag. The three ships' careers would be quite varied. Pallada would be sunk in Port Arthur by Japanese howitzers in 1904, later being salvaged by the Imperial Japanese Navy, and taken into service as the Sugaru, where she would serve until 1922. Diana would have better luck, breaking out of the Japanese blockade following the Battle of the Yellow Sea, eventually winding up back in the Baltic fleet at the end of the war, undergoing several refits that changed her armament multiple times before fighting several actions during World War I, after which she was disarmed and turned into a hospital ship. Aurora almost went to the Pacific as well, but would end up staying with the Baltic fleet for a while, before being sent out anyway with the 2nd Pacific Squadron. 
playing the role of only sane man to the rest of the squadron, and duly suffering almost as much damage from friendly fire incidents as she would eventually receive from the Japanese at the Battle of Tsushima, from which she would be one of the few ships to escape into internment, eventually ending up back in the Baltic Fleet at the end of the war. Along with her surviving sister, Aurora would be modified several times, with a number of the smaller guns removed and two additional 6-inch guns added. Mine layer and mine sweeping gear were also added, and then most of the 3-inch guns were removed in a further refit, and even more 6-inch guns added, for a total of 14, along with anti-aircraft guns and a new fire control system. Famously, she would fire the first shot in the October Revolution of 1917, and as a result, once the Soviets won the Russian Civil War, she would be retained as a training vessel, before being actually sunk in harbour by the Luftwaffe during World War II, after which she was raised again and turned into a museum ship in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, where she can be visited to this day. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.